Hi, welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I am a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln. And I thought I'd use this video to introduce what oblateness is. And this is applicable, in astrophysics at least, to stars, planets, moons, asteroids, dwarf planets, minor planets, those sort of things really. So that's what we're going to use in this context here. So what does it actually mean? Well, it refers to the flattening of a body. So here you've got Earth. Earth is fairly close to being spherical, although I'm sure certain people will argue against that. And on the right hand side there, I've essentially squashed it at the poles and made it flatter. So it's wider at the equator than it is at the poles. That would be referred to as being more oblate than the one on the left hand side. So the actual definition really is it's a measure of the deviation away from a perfect sphere. So if we were to measure how oblate, how flat it was in comparison to a perfect sphere, we would get some value. That would then give us the oblateness of it, which would, again, we get a value for that essentially, a number. Now, it's dimensionless, so oblateness, you get a number essentially. If it's a perfect sphere, then it's zero. Perfect sphere is zero. Now, as it gets flatter, so if you were to squash it at the poles, like I did previously, then what you're going to find is that the oblateness would become positive and it would then increase as you flattened it more. So it doesn't go negative, it'll be positive, and then that number will get bigger as you actually flatten it more and more. And it's dimensionless again, so it doesn't have any kind of units or anything, it's just a number. How do you actually calculate it? Well, it's quite easy, really. It's essentially just the ratio between the equatorial radius and the polar radius. Now, I've actually kind of drawn it here as essentially the diameter, but it doesn't really matter here. You just do half of that, essentially. So your A and your B is going to be across the equator and the polar regions, essentially. And what you do is, well, you get a number. And you can already see that actually... If it's going to be, well, yeah, it's essentially just a, a, a ratio between the two. So what's the most common reason for causing a flattening of a body? Well, it's rotation. If you were to rotate something fairly quickly, these objects are big enough that they have gravitational forces trying to collapse them. That's why they're spherical in the first place. Smaller objects, actually, they don't become spheres because there's not enough gravitational force there to actually mould them into spheres. Now, let's take the Earth here as an example. It's rotating. Now, at the equator, which is perpendicular direction to the actual rotation axis, the gravitational force is opposed by a centrifugal force. So as it's spinning around, there's a force going opposite to gravitational force. That counteracts it, which means that actually the gravitational force is kind of, the overall force trying to collapse it is, is kind of weaker there, I suppose, actually. So it doesn't get compressed quite as much. So you end up with it wider at the equator than it is across the poles. Now, the faster you rotate it, the more pronounced that this oblateness is, well, yeah. Fast rotating planets are flatter, essentially. All stars, all moons. As an example here, Earth rotates just under 24 hours to go round once on its axis. It has an oblateness of 0 0.0034, or approximately that. Jupiter, on the other hand, takes just under 10 hours to rotate, and it has a higher oblateness, so it's 0 0.065. So great, it's basically flatter than Earth which makes more sense. However, it also relates to what it's made of its composition. Jupiter is mostly gas. Earth is not. So that does have an impact as well. But it also mostly comes down to rotation, essentially. Now, tides can also do the same thing. A lot of exoplanets or moons, I suppose, that are tidally locked or becoming tidally locked can get significant tides that stretches the object towards the bigger object. So here you've got a, a planet being stretched or significant tides affecting it from the star. That's massively exaggerated. It's not really going to look like that. 
but it will deform it nonetheless, and that can make the planet appear oblate as well. Um, the closer it gets, the more oblate it would be. So a planet further out from the star is going to be more spherical because the tides from that star are not going to be as significant. So the closer they are, they become more important with regards to the tides. It'll also probably rotate slower because tidal evolution or the tide will slow it down and make it become tidally locked. But that's a whole topic for another video. Now, an example is this particular dwarf planet here. Now, it has a very fast rotation. It's rotating once on its axis every four hours. So this, this creates a large centrifugal force and it's opposing a weak gravitational force. Because it's a small object, the gravitational force is not quite as strong as it would be for Jupiter or the Earth or even a star. So large centrifugal force and weak gravitational force means that it's a very elongated dwarf planet or it's a very oblate planet. It's not a planet, it's smaller, but this is just an example. So fast rotation, small object, you have the potential to be quite flattened essentially. So thank you for watching. If you do enjoy the videos and you find them helpful, then do consider becoming a member and helping to support the channel. But I also have extra videos in the member section as well as other benefits as well. So thank you for watching.